Take your Bible and let's turn to a good chapter that's just smooth sailing, won't ruffle anybody's feathers, just wonderful portion of Scripture like 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I feel like I left a lot of things unsaid. And uh, I want to help you to understand the rest of the story. So 1 Corinthians in chapter 7, look there in verse 10. Now remember the apostle Paul is dealing with people who has come from different backgrounds, levels of society that have various kinds of teaching. You've got those that were Jews and the strictness of the law, and then you had the barbarians uh, that did pretty much whatever they wanted. And then Paul goes to these places and he leads people to the Lord, and lo and behold, you talk about having messed up lives. Okay, here's an example of a man and a woman, and they're barbarians, they're heathen, they're lost of the hound dog and the end of a soup bone, and he goes there and he presents the gospel, and the man gets saved. Paul's in love with the Lord and wants to serve the Lord. But now he's got a wife that's lost. Well, the scripture says not to be unequally yoked, so what should he do? Shoot her. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're watching by internet. No. <laughs> so how do you handle this? Well, that's good, because God's Word will deal with this. And because of the times in which they were living, and the persecution was great, when they were having, you know, Rome and they were killing the Christians, and uh, later on, they were even feeding them to the lions. How would you like it if um, they said, okay, here's your wife, and we're going to feed her to the lions if you don't renounce your faith in the Lord and say that, that, that Caesar is king instead of Jesus is king? You say, well, they won't do that. They did that. And then you've got to watch your wife being tore apart by lions. Now, would that cause you any concern? You say, well, maybe not. Uh, but, uh, it might cause you to think, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have got married. Well, how do you handle all of these things? And then what about those that were not married? So he addresses all of this, so I want you to see. Here. Look at verse 10. Unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Now, this is because this is written in Scripture. And he says, Let not the wife depart from her husband. Unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. In other words, you're not to get a divorce. But, in verse 11, <laughs> if she departs, and they do get a divorce, let her remain, and you're, you ought to underline these little simple things that God explained let her remain unmarried. So the Bible doesn't address the issue. It just says, okay, if you do get a divorce, remain unmarried. And there's a reason. Or be reconciled. Underline the word reconcile. It means you make peace again and you go back to your husband. In other words, you always want to keep that door open because God might do a work in that lost person's life or that one that you divorced. And so you want to keep the door open so you can go back. But if that person that you divorce gets married to somebody else, God says that you can't ever go back to that person. In the book of Deuteronomy it says that would be an abomination. So once that person that is divorced marries somebody else, the person that they had that was first is not supposed to take that person again. These are just simple things that God has laid down that would... It, all of it is just to eliminate problems. Because anytime time God says don't do something because it's going to hurt you if you do. And many people don't know that in advance and so sometimes we wish, man, I wish I'd known all of this before. And we just don't know. So what do we do then? And well, God addresses this too. Let me show you. He says here in uh, let not, in verse 11, let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. It means there's not other scriptures that uh, 
God has spoken on this subject before in the Old Testament or in the Gospels, and so he's revealing some truth that's kind of new and uh, believes it's important for the present time. But to the rest speak I, not the world. If any brother, so that's a saved man, hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. In other words, if she is okay with the fact that, okay, you you got a saved man and a lost woman, the unequally yoked? Yes, but God says you don't go back. You've got to go from here forward. He says, if she's content to stay with you, well then, let her stay with you. Don't divorce her just because of it. But he says up there in the other verse, that if they do divorce, then he has to remain unmarried. He said, well, that's bad. It's bad all the way around. That's why the disciples said to Christ in chapter 19 of the book of uh, Matthew, he says, if this is the case, it's better that a man don't get married. Because you need, in other words, giving you the impression, if you get married and she turns out to be, you know, pretty bad, you could be stuck for a long time. Now, there is separation, okay, but then you've got to remain unmarried. So, it's, it's hard, it's difficult. So, he addresses this, but now look what he says. In verse 13, and the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, well, let her not leave him. So it hits the man and the woman. For in verse 14, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. In other words, they're acceptable. In other words, generally children that were born out of wedlock, we used to say, well, they, they were illegitimate kids, or they... Uh, they were called bastards. That's an old time phrase, word, uh, that uh, born out of wedlock. But now, you take, for example, God says, if a man and a woman get married, and then one of them trusts Christ as Savior, He says, look, the marriage is still good, even if the man hasn't trusted the Lord, or the woman hasn't trusted the Lord. And the children are separable. Don't mess up and do worse just because you may want to try to find a way to get out of this thing. You know, most marriages, people are trying to find a way to get out of it. They're looking for a loophole. Now, not all cases, of course not. There's a lot of abuse and all kinds of stuff that goes on in marriages. Most men are not men. Most women would be probably content to stay with a man if a man would just be a man and have the right kind of leadership and, 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 and love and faithfulness and all that. But most people don't because of sin. We have a sinful nature. We don't always do what's right. So he says, in verse 15, But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Now, this is similar to what we read one day when we were going through the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. When the woman who is married to a man that's not right might be able to win him by her behavior. In other words, if she has a sweet, meek, quiet spirit, might be able to win him. But if you are a mean, ugly, cantankerous old lady, yeah, he may not want to be one. <laughs> and so you're going to have troubles. And so it's mentioned here, how do you know that in time, you might be able to win that person, whether it's the man or whether it's the woman, and so you uh, you gained them. Most people think it's just always easy just to start over. Well, it might be, but it may not be the best. Look what else he says. He makes a statement here in verse 16. For what knowest thou? In other words, you don't know the future. You might divorce one and get another one, and it'd be worse than the first one. Uh, here's the problem that we have in our society today. Most people don't really know how to determine whether or not the opposite sex is the right one. They don't know really what to look for. They just look at each other. She's cute. He's handsome. We love. And that's all you need. And they don't get to know one another and they don't spend enough time to see whether or not how that person is doing Generally, if a man will not obey his parents, or a woman 
won't obey her parents, she's not going to obey you. If they're not going to obey their parent and honor their parents, they probably will be a poor risk for marriage. If the man or the woman doesn't know the Lord, then they shouldn't even be dating. You should never date anybody you don't consider for marriage. If you can't marry them, you shouldn't date them. And so you don't want to run the risk. And so if they are not suitable for marriage, they would not be suitable for dating. If you will date anybody, you will marry anybody. Think it through. Most people don't. So you want to make sure that person not only knows the Lord, but they love the Lord and are serving the Lord, not because they are promising what they're going to do. If they're not doing it, you don't know they will. Generally, your future is determined by your obedience to God today. And if you're not living for Him now, you may never live. So whenever that girl marries that boy, uh, she may be seeing him at the best that he'll ever be. And vice versa. And so they don't get a chance to know each other, so they don't really know how to determine whether or not, is this a good wife? Would that be a good husband? They don't know what they're looking for. All they're going by is, <clears throat> we love each other. Well, that last, you know, until the honeymoon's over, and then you got to live with each other. And that's, see, getting married is easy. It's the living with them afterwards. That's the hard part. And there is a hard part. Now look what he says in verse 17. But as God had distributed to every man, as the Lord had called everyone, so let him walk, as I also ordained in all churches. In other words, wherever you were, under whatever circumstances, when you got saved, if you uh, got saved and you were already married, then that's the way you stay that way. If you get married, I mean you get saved and you weren't married, then use the scriptures to guide in what you do or you don't do. But he says, wherever you are, when you were called, abide in that. And then he also talks to them about those that were slaves. These times, there were a lot of slaves. And because they were slaves, okay, uh, here's a man who trusts Christ to save he's been a slave. So what should he do? Well, if you're a slave, if you can be free, try to get free. But if you can't and do things right, then stay a slave. You say, does it say that? Like, Hold on, let me show you. First of all, in verse 18, he says, Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called an uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. In other words, they were Jews that were circumcised, but now they become Christians, and so they were not supposed to try to get that changed. And there's a, a way that I'm not going to get into that. Now, if they were Gentiles and they trust the Lord, and they were uncircumcised, well, they don't have to be certain. He says circumcision in verse 19 is nothing. Doesn't matter whether you are or you're not. It has nothing to do with your salvation. And they want to take your service. But look at verse 20. Let every man abide in the same calling where is, wherein he was called. In other words, when you got saved, you got to start someplace, right? You can't go back and change everything. Start where you are and go forward. That's where he makes this statement. In verse 21, are thou called then a servant? Care not for it. In other words, don't worry about it. But if thou mayest be made free, well, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. In other words, if you're a slave, well, the Lord, you're free. But if you trust Christ as your Savior and you weren't a slave, then you can become a slave of the Lord. Like Paul says, I am a prisoner of the Lord in chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians in verse 1. Uh, the prisoner of the Lord comes from the Greek word doulos and it's a bond slave. So if you were a slave, God says, you're free. And those that were not slave, but they trust Christ as Savior, He says, now you can become a, a slave. He says, but abide where you are and if things can change, fine. But He says, now the time in which we live, they're rough, they're hard. A lot of heavy decisions to be made. So He says here in verse 23, but you are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Learn to serve the Lord, and this is what God wants you to do. You're serving God. And in this marriage situation, God wants you to do that which would please Him. Whether you're married or you're the man or the woman, regardless, for the Lord's sake. 
for the gospel's sake. Tolerate one another as much as possible. Get to what he says. In verse 24, he says, Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. In other words, from now on, you say, well, we're married. Remember this year's story when Jesus went to see the woman at the well? He says, you've had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not your husband. Did, did the Lord already know she'd been married five times? Yeah. He already knew that. <coughs> did he know that she was living with a woman? I mean, she was living with a man, that, and, and it, was, it wasn't her husband. Did he know that? He knew that. So you can live with somebody and not be married. And she didn't have five of them. Could she still be saved? Yes. Of course she was saved. It doesn't matter what you've done. Isn't it wonderful? God is a God of forgiveness. That's what we teach. That's the whole thing about our ministers. We're teaching the forgiveness of sins. So, people sin. Now, get what he says in verse 25. Now concerning virgins. So, we're going to talk about them now. He says, concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord. In other words, about what I'm going to say right now. Because this is for the present time and where we are. There's nothing wrong with a virgin getting married. Man or woman, they can get married. But if they do, he says, they're going to have an additional problem. There's going to be a lot of problems because of it. So he says, I want to help you to avoid the conflicts when you're getting married at this time. So he says, I'm going to give you my judgment on this. He says, that have obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. So whatever he's talking about, he's talking about people who want to be faithful to the Lord. If you're married and you've got a wife, then uh, she's a battle axe and all that, but she's pleased as well with you. He says, I want you to be faithful. Same thing for the wife. I want you to be found faithful. Now he's talking about the, the, the virgin. Though they've never been married, what, what should they do? He says, I want you to be faithful. So look what he says here in uh, verse 26. I suppose, therefore, that this is good, and you ought to underline this in your Bible, because of what he's talking about. For the present distress, I say that it is good for a man so to be. What? Single? Without getting married? But it's not for all time. It was only for the present time. So God's not against marriage. Uh, in the book of Proverbs, it says, He that findeth a woman findeth a good thing. God calls her a thing. <laughs> but a good thing. It, defined, it means that a woman is lost without a man. Well, anyway, we are going right here. So there's nothing wrong in finding a good woman. But it means that the woman might be lost until the man finds her. So the man's supposed to be the one looking. But today, the, the women are doing pretty good looking too. Alright, look there now in verse 27. Art thou loose, or excuse me, art thou bound unto a wife? You say, boy, am I bound. Seek not to be loose. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. Don't seek another. If you're free, he said, don't seek one. Don't seek to get married. Why? Because of the time in which we live. Then he says in verse 3, But and if thou marry, he's talking about those that are single. Thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such as such have shall have trouble. Now that's the part you need to underline. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. That means living in this physical body in this present time, you're going to have additional problems because now it's not just a matter of you serving the Lord and going through these trials and tribulations and the persecution and maybe even death. Now you've got to worry about your wife. Now you've got to worry about your husband. And so he says there is an advantage for the present time of not being married. So he says here, I'm trying to spare you, the last part of verse 28. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. And they that weep as though they weep not. They that rejoice as though they rejoice not. And they that buy as though they possess not. In other words, can you live and be faithful to God 
regardless of what happens to your wife or what happens to your kids or what happens to your possessions. This is what Christ was talking about in the 14th chapter of the book of Luke. Do you love me more than wife, mother, father? How much do you love him? Could you stand there or would you deny the Lord if they were going to feed you to the lions or your children? How much could you take? But if you didn't have those cares, you might make different decisions. He says, well, for the present time, he said, I want you to think this thing through. He said, I'm trying to spare you some problems. Now, this isn't all the time because we live in America and we don't even get persecuted for what we believe. But there was time when people took a stand. It's either Caesar was king or Jesus is king. But both of them couldn't be king. So he says in verse 31, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passes away. Whereas while we're in this world, we've got to use this world. We've got a physical body. We've got needs. We've got to take care of those things. And he says in verse 32, But I would have you without carefulness, or without worrying, without the additional care of a mate. He says, He that is unmarried careth for the things that belongs to the Lord or should and could and probably would if he loves the Lord how and you ought to underline this part of the verse how he may please the Lord you see if you're if you're if it's just you you only have to think about you in serving the Lord but if you are married now you've got to figure out how to please your wife or how to please your husband get what he says he says in verse 33, But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. See, it's the same way on both sides. In verse 34, There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. Because she can commit her whole self to the Lord. But when you're married, that woman's got to give her body to a man. And she's going to have responsibilities. And sometimes those responsibilities show up in children. And tell me if that don't tie you down. That there's additional responsibilities, financial responsibilities. You see, if uh, you have teenagers... Do you realize that you've got to teach them how to drive a car? You've got to go to the ball practices and the games and stuff like that. You've got to work hard. You've got needs to, to supply their needs, clothe them, feed them, insurance. It never ends. Because you've got a wife and, or a husband, you've got children, and your world isn't just you. It involves others. And this is why some people are not ready to get married. They get married, but they're so selfish. They only think about themselves and not the one that they married and how to meet their need and how to please them and what do you want and how can I help you? And it's all about take care of me, 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 me. And then they have conflict because of sometimes the selfishness that we have in our spirits. But look what he says. In verse 35, but this I speak for your own profit. I'm, 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 you ever had somebody say, I'm telling you for your own good. That's what he said. For your own good, I'm telling you this. Not that I may cast a snare upon you. I'm not trying to trap you. I've had people blame me for teaching the Bible. And get mad at me. Like, I, I, you shouldn't have said that. Well, is that the Bible? Am I supposed to tear this chapter out of the book? Not that I may cast a snare upon you, but... For that which is coming. And that you may attend upon the Lord. And you ought to underline these two words. Without distraction. Don't tell me being married can't distract you. Because now you've got a husband or you've got a wife. And there's another world there. A person that is single only has to think about himself. And he may be able to do more. I don't know. All I'm telling you, this is what the book is saying. 
because of the times in which they were living. But now, he said, I just don't want you to have to have these additional problems and troubles and sorrow because you're going to spend your time trying to please one another and you may not be able to do it. Persecution was great. But look what he says here in verse 36. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin. In other words, here's a man and here's this girl. And if you don't believe that you can uh, control your passion around her. And you're afraid that you might take advantage of this girl. He said, let them get married. See what he said? If she passed a flower of her age, she's old enough to get married. She wants him, he wants her, he said, and needs so required that he's the, the burning passion between the two, he says, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. Now in verse 37, Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will. Now that means, remember in the first few verses of chapter 7, he says, Do you have the self-control? And if you don't have it, it's better to marry than to burn. But if you can't control, you can abstain, he says, then that's okay. You don't have to get married. Having no necessity, but have power over his own will. That means he's got the discipline, the self-control, and he don't have to, you know, put his hands on her where he ought not, do things that he should not. He's got the discipline, and has so dis creed in his heart that he will keep his virgin doeth well. In other words, he don't have to get married. But the verse, in, in the previous verse, if they need to, they can send. It's not a sin to get married. He says in the front for the present time, he says, now, that's okay. But look in verse 38. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well. But he that giveth her not in marriage do it and you're on the line that word. Better. It's better. Now get verse 39. Now, after everything that's said, does this contradict the original intent in the garden? Does it contradict what's written in the law? Does it contradict what uh, Jesus says in the Gospels? Verse 39. At the con conclusion of all of this talking, look what he said. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband what? Liveth. But if her husband is dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. It means that she can remarry and marry this guy and as long as he's saved, he's a believer, not to be unequally yoked. Now, get what else it says. In verse 14, but she is happier if she doesn't, if she so abides the way she is. But most people think that it'll always get better. Well, it might, but it's not a sin if she does. And so sometimes there's people who are old enough to get married, but they're not wise enough. There's a lot of people that I've counseled over the years. <laughs> and they come to me for counseling. And they don't listen to a word I say. Because after I've been counseling for six months, they still get married. Now, getting married is okay. Marriage is a good thing. I like weddings. I think sometimes the two people, when they're going to get married, are a little naive. They really haven't got a clue what's coming down the road. But they're willing to face it together. And I think it's great. I love a wedding. And even at a wedding, I always give the gospel. Because when two people come together and they get married, I love you, you love me, they are joined together in holy matrimony, and it's never to be severed. Because, see, God uses marriage as a picture of salvation. I love Lord, 
I accept him, he accepts me, and we're joined together for how long? That's why he says he will never lose us, never leave us, no departing. It means no severance. Marriage is to be a picture of this union that we have with the Lord. And so whenever you do get divorced, it breaks this picture. That's why Moses, instead of speaking to the rock the second time, he hit the rock and broke the type because that wasn't to be. It was like Christ being crucified over again on the cross. And what was the consequences? That one little old deed, what was the consequences for Moses? He couldn't go into the promised land. He couldn't go into the promised land. That's pretty bad. Well, what caused that? He got angry. He got mad. Lost his cool. He got mad. And he, one deed, one little thing, cost him. After 40 years, everybody got to go into him. And God led, but it wasn't that he went to land because of what he did. Are there consequences to our decisions? Yes, there's consequences. Like I said before, I could take my arm, lay it up here, take an axe, cut off my arm. Well, I could say, you know, that was a dumb thing to do. Lord, I confess to you, that was a sinful thing. That was a wicked thing. That was a wrong thing to do. And God says, I forgive you. But it doesn't mean my arm is put back on. And I can take this podium up here and I can drive a nail in it and say, Lord, that was kind of dumb. Lord says, I can forgive him, pull out the nail, but I still got a scar. And a lot of people who put scars up on themselves for the rest of their life. Now, it don't have to be that way. So what I'm always aiming for is you can't solve everybody's problem. You can't start life over again. Stop the earth, I want off. Let's start all over again. Rewind this thing. You get one trip through. No reruns, no instant replays. Just one trip through life and trying to make the right decision. Have you messed up yet? Yeah. You always make the right decision? Well, wouldn't it be great if we could? Yeah. But we don't. And God can pull out now. But we can put scars upon ourselves. I want to try to help some of these young kids that are coming up. Not to put so many scars on themselves just because if we did it and put scars... We don't want them to follow the same trail. Don't do something stupid just because I did something stupid. Just because I didn't know doesn't mean that, well, when I found out, I don't want to talk about that. There ought not to be any issue a Christian can't talk about. There ought not to be any subject that the preacher is supposed to be afraid to discuss and teach from the Bible. Or do we take out all the things that are controversial, that are, you know, could cause some people bad feelings? Well, God solved the problem. He says, just confess it to the Lord. And God said, He forgives you. And keep getting up. God never intends for His children to live under a load or a weight of guilt for the rest of their life because of something that we do that's wrong. So, look at verse 40 again. Because a lot of times we do what we do because we want to be happy. But the way He puts it here, but she is happier. She's happier. If she so abides after my judgment. And I think also I have the Spirit of God. Believing that God has revealed some things to him on this subject that's not revealed or written in previous books. And God has given the Apostle Paul a, a lot of money. Could you sit down and write all that's in that one chapter? Think of how much is in that one chapter. Could you write a, a chapter like that? They covered so much in so few words. Whew. It has to be of the Lord. A man, natural man, can't even think of all of these things to write it down. And then it has to all be in harmony. All the Scripture has to perfectly dovetail. Now, there's a lot of preachers that do, will, we will not agree on what this is talking about. And uh, so, I want people to well, then study it on your own. You come out to whatever you believe. You are free to believe whatever you want to believe. But I want you to go by the book. And whatever it is, if it's contrary to what I teach, that's fine. I'll love you anyway. It, it won't matter to me. I'll love you. And, and, but if somebody has a problem, 
I want to help you in the midst of wherever you are and go from there. I can't, I can't rewind the clock. I can't start back. We can only go forward. And that's because you accept God's forgiveness and you go ahead. And that's what we need to teach people. That's what people need to know and that they need to understand. And so I hope this will help you just a little bit.